John chapter 3. And we'll look at verse number uh, 13 through 16. And just to make sure that Will's on the ball over there, let's start in verse 12. As, uh, <clears throat> he always asks me what verse we're looking at, and he's like, Preacher, I always pull up two before and two after, no matter what you tell me, because you end up reading different verses and you tell me. Um, John chapter 3, verse number 12 through 16. We'll read these and then uh, uh, quote another verse from Matthew when we start today. Um, the Bible says, If I have told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. Let's be seated. We'll bow to pray. Father, thank you for these uh, uh, verses and these, this passage that's recorded for us. Lord, I pray as we think um, on these next few weeks and uh, try to just prepare <clears throat> and plan, Lord, we'd most importantly um, uh, take care of the priority and lift you up. And so thank you so much for the goodness and grace. Thank you for leading me in a straight path, Father. I know my destination. I don't always know the, the path to get there, but I'm so grateful that I have that assurance and the eternal life dwelling in me, and it's because of the grace of Jesus, and we uh, praise His name, and we uh, lift Him up today. And Lord, I pray that uh, this church would be reminded that we would be uh, um, required that we must lift you on high. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. In the book of Matthew, chapter 5, it talks about us being salt of the earth and the light of the world. And it talks about letting our light so shine in front of men that others may see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. And it talks about a candlestick and, and it gives just some illustration there. But one of the illustrations in that passage, it says, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. <clears throat> and... Uh, in a few weeks, we're going to be a church on a hill that cannot be hid. My sister Sheila sent me some text about higher ground and uh, having some advertisements, and we didn't know exactly when we're going to be able to move in. And the plan is the, the mid of May. I talked with uh, Shiloh yesterday, and their, uh, their goal is to be uh, moved into their new um, place to worship on the first Sunday of May. So we've got a revival planned with Brother Rick Corum the 16th of May. And I think it'd be awesome to have him preach the first service uh, Sunday morning in that new building. But it's going to be a church on a hill. It's going to be uh, unhideable, if you will, from all that go by. No more can we get away with some of our junk behind the fence. Amen. Uh, it'll all be there to see, for everyone to bear, and to know what's going on. Uh, that's just the, that, that's the logistics of things. And it's a, a, a great, great uh, answer of God. Uh, I know that some of the things behind the scenes that not everyone knows of, but um, last uh, February, before any of these things <clears throat> uh, struck and hit with uh, the pandemic and the, the, the economy, um, the owner of this building called me, and, and just uh, in the morning, I was in the basement, and he said, hey, I just want to kind of talk with you our time frame and, and uh, when we'd like for you know, to take, can take occupancy of the building. And I said, okay. And uh, he said, I, I would like for uh, May of 2021. And if you need to, we can share it a little bit while we're uh, moving ahead. But that's our, that's our time frame. And I went, okay, sounds good. We'll do it. We'll, we'll work on it. We're waiting for our zoning to change and we're waiting for, uh, uh, our, you know, land. But, you know, we'll, Lord will provide whatever. And, and I, I remember in my basement, I didn't come to tears, but I just, I thought, God, thank you for just giving me an overwhelming peace that you're going to do something and you're going to take care of the timing of this thing. And I, did, and I now when, uh, when we tried to get the Veterans Auditorium to meet in church after we were in the American Legion, 
By the way, I found some of the tracks, our first tracks that we made with uh, just a picture of me and the American Legion. I found a box of them. They're not going to be given out anymore, I promise you that. But uh, I remember going and trying to get the veterans out of torn that we could rent it, and the county commissioner said, no, it's not going to work. And I pulled out of there, and I remember just crying, thinking, what are we going to do? We only have the Legion for a few months, and we have no place to... I cried in my car like a baby. No Kleenexes, but snot run. I mean, it was just full on. I was crying. And, uh, and then, you know, the Lord took care of that. So th- this la- uh, February of uh, 2020, I, I just, I thought, you know what? God's, I'm not, I'm not worried. And that same morning, same basement, same time frame, somebody called me and said, hey, do you know Shiloh Chapel's back for sale? And I'm like, what? Because... Uh, the restaurant had bought it, and we were trying to get it a year before in 19, and, and I said, that's interesting. And I thought, Lord, even if that's not the answer, you just told me, you just showed me that you have the answer, right. and I'm not going to worry about it. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Well, you know, fast forward a few uh, frames and a few time, and uh, we were trying to agree on a price, and and uh, I, we had prayed, and we had kind of set our feet in the sand in 2019 at a certain price. And in negotiation, they agreed to be $5,000 over that price. And I'm like, oh, this has got to be it, Lord. This has got to be it. And I'm like, hey, we're not going to worry about the price. That's close enough. Let's do it. And I got convicted, and I couldn't sleep. And I called the realtor. I said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We can't do that. You're going to have to work it out. You can find $5,000 from some other place. But I prayed. And this is the price. Yeah. And I don't want to go 20 years ahead and be second guessing a $5,000 difference of a prayer. He went back to them and they said, what in the world is the deal with five thousand? He didn't explain to them it was, it was my prayer. And they thought we were being arrogant and they almost walked away because of $5,000. And I told the realtor, I said, you make it work. You, you, this is what we, he said, it's worked, it's done, 900000 I said, okay. Whew. So now I am totally confident as we move in that building that it is God's leading God's direction. They're starting construction on this building in the next few weeks to start working on the roof, the parking lot, and to reclaim what they've invested in and and go forward. Perfect timing. Can somebody say amen? Amen. We're about to be a church that gets a, uh, a facelift, okay, that gets lifted up a little higher. And, you know, in, in, uh, with that thought, I was uh, thinking about uh, topics and, and just sermons and subjects, and, and I, I want to preach the next few Sundays on just uh, some things that we need to be aware of. But before we go and get a church lift, I want to remind myself and our church what we are being lifted up for. Because we are not being lifted up of our own worth, yeah. of our own merit, right. of our own savings, of our own, of our own efforts. If we are being lifted up by God, then there must be a divine, mm-hmm. overriding and overwhelming purpose for that to take place. And I'm going to say amen to that. And whenever something is lifted up, there's always a direct danger of pride being lifted up with it. Every time. Something that God means for good, when a person receives it, can be twisted and turned into bad. Lucifer, Satan, the the covering cherub, had a position of authority. He had brightness and beauty. There was a purpose for that. God didn't make him as a mistake. In fact, in the day he was created, Ezekiel says he was created perfect in all his ways. Till iniquity was found in him. Lifted up in a position, gave 
opportunity for pride to creep right in behind it. And pride is what got Satan his position in hell. Before we go and get a church lift and uh, get a uh, 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 put on a hill so that it can't be hid, John chapter 3 reminds us of this very priority that I want to spend this morning looking at and, and just allow the Word of God to speak to us. And uh, I know this message could be preached at any time, any moment of, of history, and and I've preached it before. I remember preaching. We had red chairs in here, uh, this message one time in, in this auditorium. <clears throat> there was a family that was trying to get to come to church, and they moved here, I believe, from Arizona. And they came that Sunday. I told them to come, and I'll, I'll give them the answer of why Jesus is compared to a serpent in the Bible. I remember preaching that, and that was my hook to get them. They came once. That's one Sunday. That's all, but they came, okay? And uh, this is a, a, a pertinent passage, but... I just want to, to put it in the lens of church, make sure that we know and we're reminded why we are given any blessing from God as a local church. Can you all say amen to that? Yeah. There's a reason. John 3, verse number 13, there's a problem. No man hath ascended up to heaven. The problem of no man ascending to heaven is because of uh, the uh, curse of sin and the disease that we carry with us. It's a problem that <clears throat> was, began in the very first human, passed along to the second human, and vice versa, passed back and forth. And then from that moment on, all of humankind is prone to the curse of sin. <clears throat> Who can ascend up into the heights of heaven? No man. No one has the right to come in front of the throne of God with its holiness and with God's righteousness and with our faultiness and with our sinfulness. It's not that God created us wrong, it's that we perverted that wrong creation and, and compromised it with sin. The problem that no man hath ascended up to heaven <clears throat> lends itself to the uh, passage that we're at. Because, as Jesus said, if I have told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things, which no one's ever seen? You never, you never ascended there. And the illustration, of course, in the beginning of John 3 is that you must be born again. Can somebody say amen? amen. Boy, that spiritual birth certificate is the most important date of your life that you know that you've called him the Lord and that he wrote your name in the book of life and that you're forgiven. It, it always pains me to hear someone say, well, I'm just trying to be good so I can get to heaven. I'm like, I feel sorry that you're trying because God's already accomplished everything for you. And you need his grace and you need it given, not you earning it and him uh, uh, paying you for it. He's not going to pay you. He paid the full price on the cross. The problem, no man hath ascended up to heaven. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, the Lord provided the answer, praise His holy name, <clears throat> but without the question, the answer doesn't mean anything. If I start calling you out numbers, 16, 49, 81, 121, 144, you might be able to fig, uh, figure out a pattern, but those numbers don't mean anything unless I ask you what's the, the square of, of 12, or what's the square of 7, or what's uh, 9 squared. Th those answers don't mean anything without the question. They're just random numbers. Jesus dying on a cross means nothing unless you have the question of, how do I get to, ho to heaven? How do I get to God? What am I going to do with my sinfulness? What, how do I stand in front of a God knowing that I have already committed these wrongful acts? The problem in verse 13 is not only that no man hath ascended up, but it goes further than that, that no man ever will ascend up on their own. It won't happen. It can't happen because of our sinfulness. 
Verse 13 gives the solution. But he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man. And you see here the solution to the problem, even before it's fully explained in John 3.16 and how it would be sent and what it would give, <clears throat> what it would accomplish. But because no man hath ascended up, he that came down from heaven. And I just can't help from showing you this. It's perplexing if you don't know doctrine. It should be a, a, something you wrestle with if you are uncertain of the qualifications of Jesus. If you ever have a human, human doubt by not being, an, un, being able to comprehend the Trinity, and that should be all of us at some point. I mean, I'm just going to be honest. How do you figure out God in three persons, blessed Trinity? It's, it, it's, it's a joggling my mind that <clears throat> the Lord is saying, why hast thou forsaken me? Well, you're the, how, how does that work? And uh, uh, look at verse number 13. He that came down from heaven... Even the Son of Man, look what the last phrase says, which is in heaven. Well, wait a second, you're on earth. You're quoting, you're giving this, this passage, you're explaining it to Nicodemus. This is not a mistranslation. <clears throat> Each of those words are exactly in the uh, Greek or in the, the Texas Receptus. It's not a uh, mess up of the grammar. You know, sometimes you can... Uh, um, mess up your ams and ors and, and ises. And if you look at the bulletin, Kevin Wade, I'm just going to go and tell you there's a mistake. Me and Will were left to ourselves, and that's trouble in the office. And it says two persons was saved this week. It should be two people. I know, Kevin. Thank you. I just want to point that out. It, it's easy to mess up grammar and uh, uh, the way things work together in language. This is not a mistake. This is a great mystery that's being revealed in front of your eyes. He that came down from heaven, that's God. Can somebody say amen? amen? Even the Son of Man, yeah, that's God. And then look, which is in heaven? How are you in heaven when you're on earth? Well, Courtney's been married to me, so she's been in heaven. And why she's No, that was, that was horrible. That's just an early service joke. I'll take that one out for the late service. But how can you be in heaven when you're on earth? Because you're God and you're omniscient. You're omnipresent and you're omnipotent. I'll say amen to that. I might not be able to explain every detail of it, but I can tell you it's a truth, and it's revealed in Scripture over and over and over and over and over again. Jesus came down from heaven because He is God from heaven. And while He's on earth, He's in heaven! And while He's in heaven, He's in my heart! He's everywhere! It's amazing! How can that be? He's God. And that's the only explanation that makes sense. The problem, no man ascended up to heaven. The perplexing truth is it says, the Son of Man which is in heaven. <clears throat> you know, even the theologians of the 18th century gone by realized that this was a magnificent passage that referred to the divinity of Jesus Christ. This is not something new that's discovered by your preacher, by any other scholar, this was, should have been known from the very time it was inscribed by the Holy Spirit. The Son of Man is telling you these things, and He's in heaven. Yeah. Yes, that's, that's the truth. That's the way it works. Sometimes my kids will say, Dad, how'd you know that? I'm like, because I'm everywhere. <laughs> I'm everywhere. You can't get away. And I'm not, but I want them to think I am. Amen. And the, <clears throat> I know what you're doing everywhere. The Lord is everywhere, isn't He? He's perplexing, and then it gives us, it brings us to this parallel. This is not the only place that it's referred to of lifting up Jesus. We'll look at a couple others in the New Testament, but it says in verse 14, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Let me just teach you a little bit of, of uh, I guess, hermeneutics, okay? A little bit of Bible study as well. Whenever you find the, the term as, like as, or as, it's going to use a, a similitude or a, or a uh, comparison to make a truth. It doesn't mean that 
<clears throat> everything it's comparing it to is going to be the exactly same as what it is that we're comparing it to. Y'all yeah, yeah. say amen? Yeah. I mean, I could say, I could say, uh, well, I'm like Lonnie Elmore. And you could say, how are you like Lonnie Elmore? Well, I, I'm in the front of the church on Sunday mornings. <laughs> you say, well, if you're like Lonnie Elmore, you must be able to play guitar. No. Well, if you're like Lonnie Elmore, you must be, no, but I'm like Lonnie Elmore that I'm at the front of the church on Sunday mornings. You follow me? When you're making a comparison, it doesn't mean that everything is going to be comparable. <clears throat> you're drawing from something. I could tell you that Will's like me. Now, we don't laugh the same. <clears throat> Thank the Lord we don't look the same. But we both came from the same training, and we both were from Wilmington. I could say, oh, I'm like Will. Will's like me. When the Lord says, and as Moses lifted the serpent, it reminds me as he also said, as Jonah was in the belly of the whale three days and three nights. There's a comparison. It doesn't mean that everything is going to be exactly the same in all those comparisons. But in this passage, it tells us, <clears throat> as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Well, if we're going to talk about lifting up something, and in this line of thinking that our church is going to be lifted up, and first a priority, we want to make sure we lift up Jesus, let's go back and look at this parallel. It's in the Old Testament, the book of Numbers, chapter 21. Numbers chapter 21. And let's see why Moses was lifting up a serpent in the wilderness. Numbers chapter 21. And when King Arad, the Canaanite, which dwelt in the south, heard tell that Israel came by the way of the spies. Then he fought against Israel and took some of them prisoners. And Israel vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, If thou would indeed deliver this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. And the Lord hearkened to the voice of Israel. You see, the, the, the conquering of the land of Canaan, it was not just a one-sided battle, they were attacked. They were, there was back and forth. And, and uh, God opened that land of Canaan up because it was time to retribute the wickedness of that land. That's why he did it. That's why he didn't do it 200 and some years or 400 years earlier because the iniquity had not yet come full. Boy, America, when your iniquity gets full, you better watch out. You better watch out. I, I'm... I don't know how to put all of it together with Revelation 18, but I'm telling you, that millstone, that millstone reference being cast into the sea and referring to mystery Babylon is frightening me and scaring me for our country. And I don't think that uh, we'll necessarily be here, but in one day, in one hour, everything is destroyed. And like a millstone, you study the word millstone, and you figure out what it's connected to about offending little kids. That's what a millstone is referenced to in the New Testament. And there's a problem there. And Revelation 18 speaks of that. But in Numbers, <clears throat> the Canaanite countries attacking Israel, and, and the Lord hearkened to the voice of Israel. Delivered up the Canaanites, and they utterly destroyed them in their cities, and he called the name of the place Hormah. And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to campus the land, compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. Interesting. The people spake against God and spake against Moses, verse 5. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, there is, and neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. 
Now, I just want to make a quick parallel that we're moving to another building that used to be a restaurant, and there's plenty of water over there, amen, and there was some bread, so uh, I don't know why we can't get away from restaurants, but that's uh, just our, our uh, story of our church moving. This verse says, The Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people. Much people of Israel died. God would never do something so mean. You don't know the God of the Bible. You don't understand what God does to discipline and to direct and to get them to their destination. They didn't like the way, but they liked the result when he get there. Verse 7, Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten when he looketh upon it shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole. It came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, what's it say? He lived. That's the passage. That's the parallel that Jesus is making to describe that the Son of Man must be lifted up. He's, how? Like Moses did in the wilderness. What, why was Moses doing that? First of all, Moses had to do that because the people forgot that the Lord heard them. Look at verse number 3. The Lord hearkened to the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites. God answers prayer. Amen. Have we forgotten that? No, I hope we don't ever forget that. <clears throat> prayer is the ultimate weapon that we wield against the, the enemy and the foe of this world. When you think nothing can change, you got a problem, friend, because you got prayer in your pocket and it's not in your, your lips and your uh, hands. Get it out of wherever you've left it and start believing that God can do something. Well, you just don't know. You just don't know. And you're a sad, sad saint that doesn't believe that prayer can change things. Sad saint. Unbelievable. Well, I know he can in some, but not. why not there? If he can forgive your sin, he can change your eternal destiny. Can somebody say amen? <clears throat> you cannot change your eternal destiny. And God did it through prayer. You prayed and called on the Lord and he forgave you. If God can forgive me of all my sin, what, what else could not he do? Well, a little hair on the side maybe might be tough, but I'm, I'm praying for that. God can do anything. He can make my head grow like a chia pet if he wanted to. Amen? But there's some other purpose. I just haven't figured it out yet. No, God, God can answer prayer. The simplest of things and the most complex of things. But they must have forgot that God heard them. Because look... In verse number five, and the people spake, what's it say? Why would you speak against the God who just heard your prayer and promised you a destination through all your enemies? Well, because I don't like the way he's doing it. <laughs> okay. There we go. You're trying to be God still. You're trying to be in control still. When are you just going to let him drive and steer? And you say, God, I want to be like you. Let him make you that way. Don't avoid the trials and the temptations and the testing and the work that he does to conform you. If you've prayed that prayer, be ready for it. Well, I didn't think it'd be this hard. Yeah, you're a hard head and he's got to do a lot of hard work on it. It's exactly why it's going to be hard. Amen. Well, I prayed that God would do anything to save this person. I know some of you prayed things like that. And then you doubt the circumstances that lead up to whatever that truth is or that result is. Praise the Lord. Whatever gets someone to their knees to get saved is going to be worth it in eternity. Amen. Whatever God uses 
to help you reach someone else. You're, it's going to be worth an eternity. They forgot the Lord heard their prayer. And he also heard their complaints. You want God to hear you at the altar, you better be sure that he's hearing you at the uh, complaint center as well. When you're complaining to God about what he's doing in your life. I'm just telling you. You want God to hear you when you're in a, in a deep uh, trial. You, you better know he's hearing you when you don't think you need him and don't want him around. I mean, if the God of heaven is open to your prayers, he ought to be open to everything you, you let sneak out of your lips. They forgot that. They had to forget the destination and got discouraged along the way. What would ever cause me to stop following Jesus? What would ever hinder me from carrying out the purpose that God has in my life? What could possibly take place that would discourage me so much that I would stop praising or pursuing or making the priority for me to, to serve in my life? I think you ought to ask yourself that question. I think you ought to. I think every Christian ought to preface their journey with saying, now what would happen that make me stop following Jesus? And I need to make sure that nothing, because I know where my destination is. I am predestined now that I'm saved. Did you catch what I said? I was very intentional. I was not predestined before I was saved. I am predestined after I'm saved to be conformed to the image of Christ. He will bring me to adoption. <coughs> So I am not going to let discouragement on the way deter the path that he's laid out for me to get to where I'm, where I'm going. Though the road may be rough and narrow, though it may be steep on every side, with the Lord of whom I promised, him only will I abide. They forgot the destination. Look at verse 2. The Lord hearkened to the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites, and they utterly destroyed them and their cities. It wasn't like they were waiting for that promise to be made. He, he's fulfilling it. Lord, if you'll help us, we'll destroy those cities. Okay, I'll help you. Thank you, Lord. Man, this way is just rough. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? And it's, it's, not, it's not something that we should... We should um, just look down the Israelites, because I think it happens in all of our Christian lives. Can somebody say amen? It does. It happens. We forget the destination and we're discouraged, by the way. And then God does something. Verse 6, and the Lord sent. You want to put a blank in your Bible? You can fill it in with whatever you think he sent in your life. Well, God's a good father. He only gives good gifts. The serpent was a great gift for Israel. The fiery serpents was a great gift for Israel. Well, my God is only a God of prosperity, and he only wants the best of my... Yes, and he's going to have to knock you off that pride pedestal so you, he can prosper you, friend. Amen? Amen? Israel's best life now happened with fiery serpents. That's what, that's what brought them to the greatest truth they could ever understand. <clears throat> the Lord sent. What's He sent in your life? I hope He doesn't have to send something in our church's life. Amen. Verse 8 says, I'm sorry, verse 7 says, Therefore the people came. See, God sent something and therefore the people came. Isn't that amazing? What, what gets someone to come to Jesus? Probably a therefore. Something was there for, and then the people came. I just hope that you uh, let something nice and cuddly be there for instead of something fiery and serpenty, okay? Because uh, the Lord knows the way in the wilderness. He knows what to send to get people to come to Him. And notice what they said. We have sinned. For we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. It is a wonderfully mature characteristic for a saint of God to be able to identify what the cause is of the problem in their life. 
Now, I don't know if every situation, every problem is from some specific sin. I do believe that Job was suffered some tribulation and he was righteous. Y'all say amen? That does happen. Uh, the curse of death is on us no matter how close you are to God in the flesh. Can you all say amen? amen. Uh, that, that we're, I'm going to die one day. Elliot, we were talking, and Elliot said, Dad, you know that dying thing? And I said, yeah. And he said, is that a long way off for me? And I said, yeah. And he said, is it a long way off for you? And I said, well, I hope so. And I said, but that's why we got saved. He said, yeah, I'm glad I'm saved. I'm glad I'm saved. And I said, I said, we don't know when. And he said, well, I hope. I hope we just get to stay with you a little longer. And he told his mom he's going to buy the property next door and get married, but then he can still live with us, and his wife can live in the house next door. That's what he told us. So, you know, there's, there's a little bit of reality got to be forced back into that thing, but... Um, but it would be wonderful if, if God sent something and then you came to God, Lord, I've sinned, and that's the problem. It's not my brother, it's not my sister, it's me, oh Lord. It's not this person, that is me, oh Lord, that's the problem. And I've always been the problem and I need your power in my life. The people came to Moses. They came to their... It's interesting. He's the only one they can come to because Aaron just died the chapter before. I believe God is teaching them that there will be one person to come to when you realize you've sinned. There won't be two. There will only be one. Right. Aaron was the high priest up until the chapter before. He's dead. Where do they go? They went to Moses. Moses, you're not the priest. No, but Moses is the type of the Lord, and Jesus is our payment and our priest and our potentate. He's all three. Yeah. He's everything to us. And they came to Moses and they, forgiveness was sought. They asked, look, look what they asked for in verse 7. <clears throat> we have sinned for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he, what? Take away the serpents from us. Now, God sent them. Surely he could take them away. Right? I mean, he don't have to call an exterminator. He can get rid of the snakes. He didn't do that. He didn't get rid of it. He let that snake endure and live right amongst them. I don't know how long, but the Bible says, The Lord said to Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is what? When he looketh upon it, shall live. So now I think we'll leave the serpents around. Well, I, I've, re I've repented, yeah, and, and let's just leave it around, so make sure next time it bites you, you'll know where to look to again, and you'll be reminded of what healed you from that fiery serpent. Amazing, isn't it? The Bible says, when he looketh, when he looketh upon it shall live. No wonder Moses lifted that thing up. He wants everybody to be able to see it. You know, someone that was five feet away could look at the serpent and live. Someone that was 500 feet away could look at the serpent and live. Now, that'll preach somewhere sometime. I don't care how far away you think you are. It's just a matter of you're looking to live, not how close you are to live. You look to Jesus, that's how you live. He'll draw you unto himself when he's lifted up. And sometimes he used some crazy things around your life to get you to finally look up. We always talk about, well, when they get to the bottom of the barrel, when they get to the bottom of the rope, when, they, when they'll finally look up. No, some people don't. Some people won't. But we want to be set on high so some people can. Amen? 
And some people will. Some people will look and live. They'll look to Jesus and they'll find everlasting life. What an awesome thought. Moses made the serpent, the fiery serpent, he made it out of brass, and there's some teaching there, don't have time to go into, about judgment, and you know, uh, brass is a shiny metal, it reflects, and it would be easy to see, and it also shows a reflection of you, if you know the labor of brass in the tabernacle construction. The serpent was the exact picture of what caused their death and caused their disease. Jesus was made sin for us. He's compared to a serpent. He'd be lifted up on a cross high on Mount Calvary so all the world could look to him and live. It's because of this priority of lifting up Jesus that I believe we're giving a place in Marysville for everyone to drive by to see. And all oh, they might not like some of the signs and some of the sights and some of the things, but they'll sure like Jesus if they look to Him. There's nothing to unlike about Him. Christian, if you've been discouraged and complaining about the way, remember the destination is heaven, and you'll get over that turbulence because you know where you're going to land. Go with me to John chapter 12, and I'll be finished. John chapter 12, verse number 31. God's voice was heard amongst the crowd. The voice that I both glorified it and will glorify it again as Jesus asked the Father to glorify the, thy name. The people therefore stood by, they heard it in verse 29. And they thought an angel spake to them, to him. Verse 30, Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Jesus didn't need to be reminded of anything. Now is this judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, what's it say? Will draw them into me. The priority of lifting up Jesus is why we have a church, and why we've been blessed, if we ever have, in this place. It's so that we can lift up Jesus. If we look at ourselves and of our own members, we have nothing to be desiring of as far as the church is concerned. I'm not trying to diss us all. I'm just trying to be very blunt. We have Jesus, and that's what is worth lifting up. Amen. Well, we got some good programs. we got some good singing. we got some good jokes. No, no, none of those are worth lifting up. We got some good, no, we don't. No, no, we have Jesus. And I'm glad that's all we need. Not we shouldn't be complacent, we shouldn't strive to do better. Uh, I, I think that all of that is, is in line. But at the end of the day, Jesus has, must have the priority to be lifted up. He said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. It's a prayer of mine that every service, especially Sunday morning services when we're more evangelistic in the outreach, <clears throat> that we will bring the congregation and the audience to a point of decision that you, if you're not saved, you can receive Christ as your Savior. If you are in sin, you need to get out of sin. If you are not where you need, you need to, you need to do something about that. And how do you coerce or convince? You don't. Here's what we do. Lift up Jesus. He will draw all men unto Him. Well, the, the, well why, is, why is not everybody getting saved? No, no, no. He didn't say He'll save every man. He'll draw every man. He'll draw you. you got to receive it. you got to accept it. you got to decide it. you got to commit. You've got to do something Jesus will get you to him. Right. You've got to do something once you get there. Y'all say amen? amen? So we'll lift him up. Man, I hope we lift him up over there on the hill. I hope that there's people that say, man, I just drove by and something just, I need to go in there. And, just, yeah. and I hope that when they come in, who's ever behind the pulpit will say, you need Jesus, that's what you need. Right. 
That's what you need. You need Jesus. I can't draw men and I can't drive men, but I can lift up. And he'll do the drawing. Every head bowed, every eye closed, Father in heaven, I pray that we would keep that priority in mind.